No matter how rough the defenses around the league can be, they can't seem to knock out all the good quarterbacks available. The most susceptible to injury, of course, is Joe Namath of the Jets. Yet he has stood up under 11 weeks of pounding. Denver's Steve Tensey is not as fortunate as last week his collarbone was broken for the second time, which meant his replacement, Marlon Briscoe, would be at the helm for Denver. And whoever named him the magician certainly knew what he was pulling out of his hat. On the first play of the second quarter, Brendan McCarthy managed to overcome his excitement and hold on to Marlin's first touchdown pass of the day. Two minutes later, it was Eric Crabtree's turn, and Denver led 14-0. Going for three in a row was more than Buffalo would stand for. So they intercepted one, setting up their first touchdown. Gary McDermott brought the ball to the one inch line, where quarterback Ed Rutkowski snuck it over to cut Denver's lead to seven points. Marlin took offense to that, so with 30 seconds left in the half, he turned Floyd Little loose, and Denver led at halftime 21-7. The fun was just beginning. Booker Edgerson stole some of Marlin's thunder and his lead with this 35-yard touchdown run to put Buffalo back in the ballgame. Not quite. Marlin then threw his fourth touchdown pass of the day. This one to Al Denson early in the fourth quarter. Then the game got very interesting. An interference call allowed Buffalo to score a touchdown and a two-point conversion. On the kickoff, Gus Holloman apparently took Denver out of trouble by returning it 67 yards. Denver couldn't move, so Holloman then intercepted a pass and scored a touchdown himself. Not quite, as unfortunately it was called back for clipping. So Bobby Howfield kicked a field goal and Denver took a comfortable lead. Not comfortable enough, it seems, as Howard Kindig blocked a punt and Gary McDermott took it in. With a two-point lead and one minute to play, all Denver had to do was run out the clock. Not this time, said George Sames. So he picked up Floyd Little's fumble and ran it to the 10-yard line. Bruce Alford kicked a field goal, and with 30 seconds left, Buffalo took the lead. Is all lost for Denver? Not quite. Briscoe went right back to Floyd Little for a 60-yard completion. With seven seconds left, Bobby Howfield kicked a 12-yard field goal 
and Denver has now won as many games as the Green Bay Packers. Today was rookie day as Boston started eight first-year men. For a while, it looked like the rookies of the upper hand and might even have an easy day against the Dolphins. The game started with powerful running by R.C. Gamble and accurate passing by Tom Sherman, both rookies. But the Miami defense was hitting hard even when it gave up big yardage, and this was a sign of things to come. Boston scored early on a 15-yard field goal by Gino Capaletti. And they wasted no time scoring again. Sherman laid a perfect pass in the arms of rookie Aaron Marsh, who was all alone after the catch. The 60-yard score put the Patriots ahead 10-0. But now it was time for the Dolphins and Bob Greasy to show Boston a few tricks. Greasy moved his team downfield with quick passes and eventually tossed nine yards to Larry Zonka to cap the 67-yard drive. This made it 10-7 in the second period. Greasy continued to dominate the game with his passing. On this play, he scrambled around and around and found Howard Twilley for a big gain. This set up Jim Key's 17-yard field goal, which knotted the score at 10-10. Then, with little time left in the half, Dick Anderson picked off a Sherman pass and returned it 13 yards before he fell on the slippery field. This interception set up another score. There was only one second left in the half, but it was enough time for Jim Keyes to come on the field. It was his second field goal of the day, and it was good for 17 yards. put the Dolphins ahead, 13 to 10 at the half. Midway through the third quarter, Sherman dropped back to pass and made the mistake of throwing without the ball. The Dolphin recovery set up Greasy's three yard pass to Carl Noonan, who was wide open at the goal line. This made it 20 to 10. Tom Sherman is a rookie quarterback. And today he learned to watch out for Dick Anderson, who made his second interception with a great steal of a pass intended for Art Graham. Anderson made one move and ran 96 yards for a touchdown that put the game hopelessly out of reach. This score made it 27-10 early in the fourth quarter. The Dolphins scored one more time. 
first greasy through to Jim Kick, who made a nice run for long yardage. Then he tossed to Carl Noonan. This was Noonan's second touchdown catch of the day, and it was Greasy's third scoring pass of the day. Noonan's touchdown wrapped up a convincing 34-10 Miami victory. It took Oakland 14 minutes to start rolling, but from then on, the bingo was a treed cap. Darrell LaMonica's 26-yard pass to Warren Wells set up number 23, Charlie Smith's seven-pointer. Despite excellent running by number 18, Paul Robinson, and flamboyant plays called by quarterback Dewey Warren, Cincinnati could amass only 160 yards total offense against almost 600 yards for the Raiders. The Oakland defense played superbly, stopping the bingo threats repeatedly. Warren Powers made the game's only interception to halt one Cincinnati drive. LaMonica's passes soon led to another Oakland score as he hit Warren Wells for 58 yards. He then connected with number 35, Hewitt Dixon, who scored and bounced the ball into orbit. Paul Robinson's great running was to no avail, as the Bengals were continually forced to give up the ball. When they did, LaMonica, senior hitting Fred Bolitnikoff for 18 yards, had the Raider offense powering along in high gear. The last play of the half was a screen pass to Hewitt Dixon, who covered 33 yards. Although it did not lead to a score, it was an omen of things to come. The score was 14-0 Raiders at the half. Oakland's offense got even better in the second half. LaMonica's passes, like this 41-yarder to Charlie Smith, set up two George Blanda field goals, and the Raiders led 20-0. The Raiders' powerful running game was led by Hewitt Dixon and rookie Charlie Smith, seen here battering his way for 21 yards. But it was LaMonica's passes that hurt the most. His 32-yarder to Fred Bolitnikoff set up Charlie Smith's nine-yard burst for his second touchdown. Cincinnati's inability to stop the pass cost them seven more points when quarterback George Blanda hit Billy Cannon number 33, who looked like a hermit in the end zone. With the final score, 34-0, the Bengals did not offer their fans very much. But it's the thought that counts. 
The New York Jets were six-point underdogs when they suited up to face the San Diego Chargers on the West Coast. But the Jets made San Diego into the underdog in the Western Division race. You can't give all the credit to the Jets for their win. San Diego sometimes played like they weren't even there. The glue-fingered receivers of the San Diego Chargers became completely unglued against the New York Jets. Passes and patterns were being executed as well as ever, but sure hands became unaccountably stiff. And if the Chargers weren't dropping passes, the New York Jets secondary was simply stopping them before they got there. Even San Diego's elusive runners became quite available to the Jets' quick defense. New York really didn't even need a rushing attack, with Joe Namath hitting number 13, Don Maynard, with frightening accuracy. This 87-yard scoring play frightened the Chargers early in the game as New York took a 10-0 lead. However, the Jets were not flawless. Number 41, Matt Snell, forgot to turn, and Namath was dead on target. But where the Jets' mistakes were humorous, the Chargers were not. The Jets and Matt Snell opened the second quarter with their second touchdown of the game and led 17 to nothing. The Chargers' response to New York's lead was not very effective. Although this time, the Chargers defense foiled the Jets. But how do you foil number 11, Jim Turner, the league's leading scorer whose three field goals in this game gave him the pro record of 31 in a season? And there are still three games to go. San Diego's answer to the Jets' 20 to nothing lead was characteristic. <laughs> However, this time, the Chargers stopped New York outside of Jim Turner's field goal range. So the Jets were forced to punt. Number 45, Speedy Duncan, almost fumbled the ball. New York will wish he had. It was love and kisses for the Chargers, now trailing 27, but Joe Namath did not let them long enjoy their laurels. Namath threw a perfect strike to a wide open Bill Mathis, and that was about all she wrote for the first half.
The Jets led 27 to 7. Which was painful for some to believe. The Chargers offense in the third quarter was like the Chargers in the first and second. The game's strategy seemed to be give the ball away, let New York score, and hope Speedy Duncan will return the kickoff for a touchdown. Namath and Maynard obliged by taking the Jets to the one on the last play of the third quarter. The Jets started the fourth quarter the same way they opened the second quarter, running for a touchdown. Bill Mathis scored for the second time today, and New York led 37-7. Speedy Duncan did not return the kickoff for a score, but he didn't have to. All of a sudden, San Diego came alive and drove 80 yards for a touchdown. But it wasn't easy. On fourth and two on the Jets three yard line, John Hadle found Jack McKenna. The Chargers made a two-point conversion, but it was far from enough. The sign signifies a San Diego touchdown, but it may symbolize San Diego's title hopes. The 37 to 15 drubbing by the New York Jets puts John Hadle and company in trouble. They are now a full game behind the Raiders and the Chiefs. Who knows? The New York Jets may have sent San Diego to the showers for the 1968 season. This is the situation in the American Football League with three weekends remaining. In the Eastern Division race, the New York Jets are leading the Houston Oilers by three games, which means that the Oilers must win their three remaining games to be tied with the New York Jets. Should the Jets win at least one of their three games, they will win in the East. Now, in the West, it's a bit more complicated. The Oakland Raiders and the Kansas City Chiefs are tied with a 9-2 record, and San Diego is a half game back with an 8-3. Now, the Chargers have a bit of a problem in the Western Division race. They must play Denver. In addition, they must play Kansas City and then Oakland. They have to win all three for there to be a three-way tie. Should either the Oakland Raiders, the Kansas City Chiefs win all of theirs and San Diego lose one, there would then be a two-way tie. So it's still a toss-up in the West. I'm Charlie Jones. If I were only your TV weatherman, I could predict three weeks in advance what the prevailing win in the West would be.